Welcome to MTN Outdoors. Oh, hi everybody, and welcome to a very special Christmas episode of MTN Outdoors. I'm your jolly old guide, Andy Curtis. And what brings families together during the holidays more than great food, thoughtful presents, and some classic stories about the great outdoors here in Montana. And only at MTN Outdoors can you see all of your favorite cold weather stories in one convenient location to help you celebrate the holidays. So in tonight's episode, you'll see such classics as Montana Ice Jams, a cool name for a very big problem. And the state saw some of its coldest temperatures this past week in a very, very long time. MTN Outdoors meteorologist Curtis Grevenitz will tell us how this was a once-in-a-lifetime event. We'll see how Montana-made maple syrup is connecting people more to their food, and why Canada doesn't have the market cornered on the breakfast staple. We all know that Yellowstone National Park is a big draw for tourists, but did you also know it's a big draw for ducks? We'll have those stories plus a very special MTN Outdoors brag board. But first, before we get to any of that, MTN's Brianna Juno takes us to the Rocky Boy Reservation where they're trying to revitalize a very old way of life. It's a beautiful morning out here on the Rocky Boy Reservation. All this fog does a great job of hiding what's behind me in this field. What you don't see is a magnificent herd of Inni, or bison, and the tribe just recently received 10 more head. It's a great step in revitalizing an old way of life. And so now the buffalo are starting to expand out, get bigger and bigger, and so too are Indian people. The Chippewa Cree tribe first received buffalo at the end of October in 2021. We haven't had buffalo on these on these plains for 150 years. So it was a very emotional day when the when the buffalo returned, but at the same time we knew we had to reestablish a relationship with the buffalo. So what does that mean? How do we manage them? How do we get along? What are they going to require? Jason went on to say that bringing the buffalo home was more than just a cultural significance. It was always about keeping that relationship with a sacred buffalo alive and working towards building a sustainable future for the tribe. And this buffalo is going to help us find out who we are. And so that's what we truly believe. And so that's why we work so hard to bring the buffalo home. And now that we got the buffalo home, again, we're learning how to, how to get along, how to figure out how we can uh, cohabitate again. Within the past couple of weeks, the tribe received 10 more buffalo from the American Prairie Association. Um, you know, bison are integral to these lands. Um, they're integral also to the lives and economies of Native nations like Rocky Boy. Um, so we're happy that we were able to play a positive role in returning bison, um, not only to tribal lands, but just to the prairie landscape in general. So when you have good organizations such as American Prairie that try to fly under the radar, but keep constantly doing, putting, putting good work in to bring this buffalo home, you know that it, 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 it's meant to be. According to Jason, sustainability begins with providing for the Chippewa Cree people that the buffalo made a pledge to the creator way back when too on, on that he was going to provide for his children and that was to, to feed our people. But at the same point in time, I think, again, we want to build to the point where we're sustainable, we, where we're not having to ask for money that in, indeed the, the, the meat from the buffalo are, is going back into the community and it's a healthy uh, organic meat for us, uh, something that's been in our DNA for thousands and thousands of years. It's a great step in the right direction of bringing back a significant way of life for the Chippewa Cree people. We look forward to nothing but beautiful things. On the Rocky Boy Reservation, Pita Sapuaki, Brianna Juno, MTN News. And stick around everybody because when we come back, we'll see the sweet science behind this made in Montana breakfast table staple. There's plenty more MTN outdoors to come right after this. Ah, welcome back, everybody. It's sweet. It's delicious. And I'm going to guess this was a big part of a lot of your breakfasts this morning. Of course, I'm talking about Montana-made maple syrup. And as it turns out, this sweet stuff is helping a lot of Montanans connect more with their food. So take that, Canada. Ah. 
David Knutson of Missoula started tapping trees commercially in 2019 and has a unique approach to his craft, one that's caught the eye of a local arborist right here in Billings. My business model is very different from the conventional uh, sugar producer who has one large pan and one large sugar shack that makes just one bottle of syrup or maybe a few different grades of dark and light. What started as a hobby for Knutson built itself into a business and that presented another opportunity. I'm really community focused. Uh, I like the educational component is what's most important for me. Uh, I love teaching people and giving people skills and knowledge and letting them you know, have a, a, a taste, literally, of uh, the place they live. Knutson taps multiple types of maple trees throughout Missoula to bring a taste of nature's candy to Montanans. I tap trees down in Corvallis at the Daily Mansion, and I have trees that I'll tap in East Missoula. Uh, I have trees that I'll tap in Lolo, so I'm kind of spread far apart. He mentioned that there are over 30,000 maples in the Missoula Valley, most of which were planted or naturalized over the last hundred years. And that availability created the opportunity for Montana Maple Works to be born. I was able to find privately owned trees and kind of build my business uh, by just utilizing people's yard trees. The uniqueness of maple tapping, he says, is part of why his business took off. It's not something that's done around here and most people Although there are a contingent of Northeasterners and upper Midwesterners, most people around here have no clue and have not been exposed to the art of sugaring. That art caught the attention of Billings Arborist Josh Smith, and maple tapping could soon be on its way to the Magic City. A lot of people are particular about their trees and their tree health. And so I think that, you know, giving, like, giving back to them by, one, you know, having a good, healthy tree that you're maintaining, and then also um, be able to kind of give a, get a byproduct off that tree you know, besides just wood. And he says Billings has plenty to offer on the maple syrup front. There's a really lot of good big maple trees that were planted back in the 20s, 30s. And so our, they, they just need to be maintained. And if they're maintained, they're going to produce. A lot of customers that already have like downtown areas where they have trees that they're already paying to maintain. And maybe they just want some more out of it, more production. That production provides a connection, which is what makes Montana maple syrup production truly special, according to Knutson. They're connecting directly with the sugar maker. I mean, that's what people want. That's what people are more moving to in terms of knowing where their food's coming from and, and having that, that bioregional connection to their food. In Billings, Phil Van Pelt, MTN News. And I hope Santa brought you an extra pair of long johns this year because that cold stretch of weather we just got through was some of the worst the state has seen in a very, very long time. MTN Outdoors meteorologist Curtis Grevenance will show us in this next story why timing and location were just perfect this year for us to get hit right in the stocking stuffer with a blast of Arctic air. Wednesday night could very well be the coldest temperature some of us ever experience in our lifetime. That is not an embellishment, rather a testament to how incredibly cold the night will be. The coldest temperature ever recorded in the lower 48 United States is, of course, 70 below at Rogers Pass on January 20th, 1954. While it's unlikely this record will be broken, a few of the coldest locations in Montana could be within shouting distance. Gates Park in the Bob Marsh Wilderness could touch 60 below zero. Elk Park on Interstate 15 near Butte could bottom out near there as well. Even out in the Helena Valley, temperatures could come close to 50 below, and that's without the wind. Most of the state will have lows 30 below or colder. What's the reason? Arctic high pressure will settle right over western and central Montana on Wednesday night. This high pressure will be extremely strong at about 1,064 millibars or nearly 31.5 inches of mercury. As much as 12 inches of new snow will fall through Tuesday night into Wednesday. Fresh snow on top of an already deep snowpack will aid in colder temperatures Wednesday night. Strong high pressure overhead at night with clear skies, calm wind, and fresh snow on the ground maximizes radiational cooling. This is a perfect storm, so to speak, which will allow for temperatures to drop to levels that some people have never seen before or may ever see again. Stay warm. And now you're a little more weatherwise. And with all that cold comes a whole lot of ice. And with a whole lot of ice comes ice jams, which I recently found out 
aren't as cool as they sound. MTN's Jolie Sally shows us the dangers of ice jams on our rivers. Historically, ice jams have been a nuisance here in Logan when the Gallatin River gets blocked, floods, and puts these surrounding houses at risk of being damaged. Ice jam looks more, more like, you know, you know, big to medium sized chunks of ice that pile up. Mm -hmm. So you see, you know, it's not, it's not a uniform surface like you see over there. FWP Information Officer Morgan Jacobson says Logan is notorious for being affected by floodwaters from the Gallatin due to ice jams. You can see here Logan residents are no stranger to dealing with the freezing floodwaters. That broken up shelf ice that kind of stacks up in, in one place, then you get water that kind of gets diverted out of the river. For now, it looks like they're in the clear. But in Ennis, it's a different story. These photos were posted by the Ennis Police Department after ice jams on the Madison River led to flooding, forcing them to close Lions Park east of the three pedestrian bridges. Ennis Fishing Access Site and Valley Garden Access Site are closed as well. You know, what we see is, is uh, ice jams kind of stack up close to those areas. You know, snow will come and blanket all of that. So you can't really see or tell what's going on underneath. Jacobson says they have to keep these sites closed until the weather allows them to go in, assess the area, and make any needed repairs. He says this time of year is when they see the most ice jams. In fact, this time last year is when it happened on the Madison River in that same area. Water is currently entering Lions Park at a moderate rate through the repaired levee that failed last year. Jacobson says to be careful recreating on any body of water this time of year. You really need to be uh, safety conscious, not walking on on unstable ice, venturing into sites that clearly have, uh, you know, flooding issues or, or have been inundated with ice. In Logan, Jolie Salee, MTN News. For people, the best way for us to glide across water is to wait until it's frozen. But some bugs can move smoothly on the surface of water as if they were skating on it. To figure out why they are able to skate on water, let's get down to the molecular level and talk about atoms. Everything in the universe is made up of atoms, and atoms are made up of parts called neutrons, protons, and electrons. The protons have a positive charge, the electrons have a negative charge, and opposite charges attract, and similar charges repel each other. Water molecules are more attracted to each other than they are to other materials, so they generate a force to stay together called surface tension. It's the reason why water forms drops on a surface. You can see this if you put a drop of water on a table. The molecules of water in that drop will actually stick together to create a dome shape instead of just being completely flat to the table. Imagine a water molecule as a fridge magnet. It has a positive side and a negative side. Now, if you were to pull off the magnet from the fridge, some force is required, but not that much. And to break through the surface of water, it's even weaker than what it takes to pull off a fridge magnet. If the force of an insect's foot on the water is less than the surface tension of the water, then they will float. While if the force of their foot is greater than the surface tension, then they'll sink. What determines the amount of force the foot produces is from the weight of the insect and its foot shape. If the foot is flat and wide, the weight is dispersed across a greater surface area and the force is less than if the foot were sharp and thin. So the reason why some insects can walk on water is by being super small, very light, and having the ability to spread out their weight. Therefore, they're not exerting enough forces to break the connections that hold water molecules together and thus have the incredible ability to glide on top of the water. Small insects, spiders, and even the basilisk lizard are able to take advantage of these traits. Scientists are studying the legs of all of these species and water striders in particular in hopes of making materials that easily repel water and help objects move faster over water. In Missoula, Tannersall, MTN News. Welcome back, everybody. Yellowstone National Park is really the gift that keeps on giving all year round. From breathtaking thermal features to videos of tourists being chased by wild animals, the park is endlessly fascinating. And as Penny Preston is about to show us, it turns out ducks are just as interested in Yellowstone National Park as we are. 
This is Lahardy Rapids, a favorite spot for amateur and professional photographers in Yellowstone. In the spring, grizzly bears often come here to eat the carcasses of bison. But just for a couple of weeks each May, knowledgeable photographers come to see a rare sighting, even in Yellowstone, harlequin ducks. The males look like they are painted, cobalt blue with white facial markings and rusty patches on the heads and wings. They're named harlequin ducks after the harlequin clowns of 16th century Europe. These two men from Utah brought big lenses to get the good shots here in Yellowstone. If you can get them laying there on the rocks and, and uh, you know, get a slower shutter with the water looking all smooth, it can be really cool. These fast water loving birds seem like they have a death wish. They dive repeatedly into rabbits that seem to swallow them. Then they come back up again and again after grabbing a bite from below. Even my husband, who studies golden eagles, is impressed with these birds. Rapids here are something that they really look for, and you won't find them outside of the rapids. This is a, a protected area for them. They feed in these areas. They're able to withstand the rapids, and this is a, a real protection for them as well. The colorful males will be here just long enough to mate. Then they leave. But what brings these ducks to this place? Dr. Robert Smith gave me the answer. He started studying Yellowstone's geology in 1956, but the Hebgen Lake earthquake near the park's western border sealed his life direction. I got up there and I got to see this huge fault scarp 20 feet high that marked the Hebgen Lake rupture, which is 40 miles long. And I got really interested in earthquakes because of that particular event. It kind of turned me on to geophysics. So what causes the unique habitat that draws in the colorful ducks? Well, it's Yellowstone's fault. Yellowstone's faults, actually. Dr. Smith says there are two intersecting faults near the Lahardy Rapids that cause the wonderful white water that brings in the Harlequin ducks. For MTN News, I'm Penny Preston reporting with Yellowstone Revealed. Oh, sunshine. There's nothing quite like nature. Yeah, where are we going to go? The fresh air against your skin. Alrighty. The vast smells like pine and dew. <laughs> For Lisa Willman, the imprint of a wheel connects her to those moments. Well, you don't want to give me that much leeway. You might not see me for the rest of the day. <laughs> Leaving behind a trail that represents far more than the average eye would pick up on. In September of 2014, I had a motorcycle accident and became a, what they call an incomplete quad. Lisa and her husband moved to Colorado to be outside. At that time, I thought pretty much everything was over. It, it was horrible. I specifically remember watching somebody walk their dog across the street and it just tore me up. I'm like, I'm not even ever going to be able to do anything like that. She thinks back to her volunteer position at the state park that she's been with for nearly a decade. At a volunteer meeting we had here about two weeks before my accident, Ted had brought the track chair up and had it at the volunteer meeting because he wanted people to see it and what it was. You know, unbeknownst to me, within months, I'd be using it. Now, all these years later. God, what a beautiful, look at that blue sky. Strapped into her track chair. If I could get the scoop or the snow plow on here, I could do a lot more. <laughs> her humor on display. I want to do this thing in the snow so bad. <laughs> She's like a kid in a candy shop on these trails. I just, words can't describe how good it feels. Unlike other wheelchairs, these all-terrain power track chairs can conquer different obstacles. Think of them as four-wheel drive wheelchairs. Their tank-esque tracks allow the person using them to traverse rocks, creeks, tall grass, uphill climbs, and even sand. I love going over the the bumps and the rocks. We're not on our time schedule. We work together with them to say, how long do you want to be out here? We can take over and operate the chair if someone gets fatigued or wants to <clears throat> tilt the chair back and take in the scenery. Kristen Waltz, the program director at Staunton State Park, says this park has paved the way for Colorado. Similar programs are in South Dakota, Georgia, Michigan, and Minnesota, and Kristen says more are bound to pop up. To be able to support other parks, I think right now I have three emails in my inbox of parks who have reached out. We're ready to really 
take it nationwide and support other programs as they get started. These track chairs can change people's lives. Oh, definitely. They're also giving people hope <laughs> and a reason to travel just for these opportunities. And we probably get close to 100 reservations on day one and fill up for a lot of the summer, but we are always working to get people in um, midweek if they're coming from out of state. Lisa would be the first to tell you, being in that chair, experiencing the sights and sounds of nature. I'm going too fast. Creates independence. Oh yeah. Many people crave and deserve. You don't accomplish anything if you let the fear keep you from doing it. In Pine, Colorado, I'm Jesse Cohen reporting. Well, that should just about do it for us here this week at MTN Outdoors. Thank you for spending some time with me and thank you for continuing to send in great photos of you out there enjoying the great outdoors here in Montana. So without wasting any more time, let's unwrap one final gift this holiday and take a look at this week's MTN Outdoors brag board. We'll start things off tonight with some pictures from Amber. And this first pick is a great one of three golden eagles all standing guard in a row. Now it's cool to see just one of these big raptors, let alone three, all together at once. And if you like that, you're gonna love this. Her next pictures are from a little warmer period here in the state, and some very, very nice muley bucks. I don't know if you're a hunter at all, Amber, but if you are, I hope at least one of these guys ended up in your freezer this past fall. Thanks for sending in these pictures, and please send some more. Our next picture comes from Robin in Big Sandy. And Robin wrote me in an email saying, I'm dreaming of a white Christmas. Well, I hope that dream has been fulfilled, Robin. Love the lighting set up and hope you have a Merry Christmas. Please send me some pictures of you guys taking down these lights once the time is right. Thanks again, everybody, for sending in those photos, and please keep them coming. If you got a new set of skis this Christmas, a new fishing pole, any kind of outdoor equipment that you want to show off, Take a picture of you using it outside and send it to me, andy.curtis at ktvh.com, and you could find yourself at the end of a future episode. And until next week, everybody, stay safe, stay warm, Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, and I'll see you out there.